Okay, so I want to tell you today about encryption. It's a field I've worked in for, for about 20 years. So let me first tell you what encryption is. So it's a process uh, for scrambling messages so that when you send the scramble message to a person, only that person can possibly descramble. Right? And the purpose, of course, of encryption is to provide confidentiality of your messages. If you want to send a friend a confidential message, say over the internet, you want to scramble the message so that only your friend can descramble and no one else is able to descramble. That's the purpose of encryption. It provides confidentiality. And historically, by which I mean for thousands of years, encryption has been used by, primarily by armies, um, you know, by diplomats, by spies, to preserve the confidentiality of the communications. In the last few decades, though, with the advent of computer networks, in particular the internet, there's a need for protecting data uh, that, that's, that's felt by ordinary citizens, not just by armies or militaries. Okay, so to convince you of the need for encryption on the internet, here's a picture of the intranet. So the two communicating parties we typically call Alice and Bob. So they're, they're talking perhaps by email or sending each other MSN messages or engaging in a Facebook chat. And clearly, clearly these emails are likely of really you know, high importance, looking at Alice and Bob. Okay, so Alice composes a long email message and sends it over to Bob. So the email tra travels over the internet to get from Alice to Bob's computer. And if you don't know how this works, the long email is typically broken into packets of a fixed size. Each packet finds its way from Alice's computer through some path to Bob's computer. Now, along these paths, the dots represent computers on the internet. And there's millions of these. And two paths adjoin, two of these nodes are joined by an edge if those computers are actually connected somehow. So perhaps the connection from Alice's laptop to the first computer is a wireless link. This would be the wireless internet in her home. Perhaps the link between the next two computers is an um, underground cable. Perhaps the next link is an ordinary telephone cable, and so on. Okay, so now these packets all have to get from Alice's to Bob's computer. And in fact, the packets may take different paths in getting from Alice's to Bob's computers. So the first packet may take a path like this. The second path may take a long, this packet may take a longer path. And at the end, the packets are all collected by Bob and composed into the original email message. Okay, but the point here is that as the packets travel from Alice to Bob, um, they can be read by any computer along the way through which the packet passes. So when you send an email message, the packets of the email typically may get uh, passed through five or more computers, and you have no idea what these computers are, who owns them, who has access to the data that's sent through them. So a priori, without any protection to email, your email can certainly be read by people who have access to the computers uh, along the path from Alice to Bob. For example, if one of these links is a wireless link, then any eavesdropper can very easily read the packets that are sent from this link to that link. Okay, so a priori, Alice and Bob have no confidentiality whatsoever for their emails, their Facebook chats, and their MSN messaging. Okay, this may not be a very serious application. More seriously is when, in this case, Bob is an actual person, and Alice is the set of servers for a large company. So for instance, as if Bob is doing his online banking, say with CIBC, in this case, Alice is actually CIBC's computer that's talking with a person, Bob. At some point, Bob wants to download his bank information over the internet, and he wants that to be secured. Because otherwise, any eavesdropper who's sitting in any of these nodes along the way might be able to read uh, Bob's private banking information. Okay, similarly, if Bob purchases something from a store, Amazon.com, uh, this would be Amazon's computers. At some point, Bob wants to pay for the transaction by sending Alice his credit card number, which he doesn't want to send in the clear because an eavesdropper might read it. So Bob wants to somehow encrypt, scramble his credit card number, send it over the internet so that Alice can descramble. And anyone along the way who sees a scrambled credit card number can not deduce the actual credit card number. In case I hope you are convinced that encryption is a very important thing to have when you communicate over the internet because it provides confidentiality. And if you don't use encryption, you have no confidentiality at all for anything you send over the internet. Okay, so let me tell you how encryption works at a high level. There are three main ingredients. 
um, there's an encryption mechanism that scrambles messages and a decryption mechanism that descrambles messages. And this has to be a rule that tells you how to scramble and descramble. That's called a key. Okay, so to illustrate the idea, I need two volunteers and maybe Jeff. Here are my two volunteers. All right, so Ed can stand, this is Ed, Ed can stand over here and Dale next to him and maybe Jeff at the other end. Okay, so, so I'm Alice in this demonstration. I actually like playing Alice. Jeff likes playing Bob. And Dale and Ed here are nodes on the internet. So they're computers along the internet somewhere. So when I send an email message to Jeff, uh, it, it first goes to Dale, who passes it on to Ed, who finally delivers the email message to Jeff. Bob. Bob or Jeff. OK, Jeff is both Jeff and Bob. I'm Alice and Alfred. Okay, that's, that's convenient. OK, um, so the thing is, uh, Dale and Ed are sort of nice guys, but I really don't know them. So not necessarily, they're not necessarily bad, but I don't know them. So I really can't trust them. Okay, so I need to send Jeff this highly secret message using a physical process. So I'll put the message in this highly secure box, which you can't open once I've locked it. So the idea is I'll lock the box, send it over the untrusted people, Dale and Ed, who delivers it to Jeff, and Jeff can unlock. The problem though is I need to give Jeff a key so he can unlock the lock. So what I'll do is I have this lock here with two keys. Um, I'll take one of the keys out of the keychain. And I'll arrange a very secret meeting with Jeff when no one's looking. And I give him one of the two keys. OK, so now Jeff and I share a secret key for this lock. So of course, I can open the lock. I've put the message in the box. I lock the box, take out the key. <laughs> I give the box to Dale, who tries opening it, but he can because it's a really strong box, a really strong lock. Passes on to Ed, untrusted Ed. Never trust Ed. Ed gives the box to Jeff. And of course, Jeff can decrypt because he has the key, which unlocks the box. And he opens the message and reads the really secret message, which, of course, Dale and Ed can't read. It's not a very exciting message. So, okay. so that's how inscriptions work over the centuries. Thanks. I'll call you up again in a few minutes. Okay, so this works fine with a physical object like a box. You can't send the box, you, know, you can't put your email in the box, send it over the internet. So you need some mathematical process which emulates what I just showed you of securely putting a message in the box and locking it. Okay, and these are encryption schemes that have been designed over the last several thousands of years. So here's one sort of elementary scheme designed by an Indian philosopher called Vatsyayana about 2,000 years ago. It's a very simple idea. So here the secret key is a scrambling of the English alphabet. And more precisely, what Alice and Bob would do in the privacy of their, you know, of their chambers would take the English alphabet, A through Z, and pair it up in a random way. So in the secret key, the letter A is paired with the letter S, B is paired with the letter N, and so on. This is the key that only Alice and Bob know, their secret key. OK, now to send a encrypted message. Suppose Alice wants to send Bob the message, silly putty. Um, he uses the, she uses the secret key to encrypt the message. So the S gets encrypted to an A, because S corresponds to A in this pairing. Similarly, R gets encrypted to C, because of this pairing, and so on. It's a very easy encryption process. And what Alice sends to Bob over the internet would be the scrambled message, the encrypted message. OK, when Bob receives, how does Bob decrypt? How does Bob recover the unscrambled message from the scrambled message? Yeah. He uses the same key because they have the same key, right? So to descramble, Bob looks at the A and knows that it should be mapped to an S using the same secret key. So he transforms the A to an S and so on and he recovers the original message. Okay, so Alice and Bob share the secret key. No one else knows the secret key. So Alice can encrypt the message with the secret key in this way, send Bob the scrambled message, and presumably only Bob can descramble because only Bob knows the secret key. Okay, I said presumably. <laughs> Is this a secure encryption scheme? So now if you play the role of the attacker, you don't know the secret key that Alice and Bob picked. All you have is captured 
scrambled data. And your goal is to find the unscrambled data. Okay, so let me give you a little challenge to try this. So here's a challenge uh, scrambled piece of data that you as the eavesdropper or attacker has somehow intercepted. Yes? Oh, so, okay, some of you tried it before uh, this started, so I'll let you know. I'll, I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Some folks just walked in. Okay, so that's the captured scrambled data, and our goal is to find, try to unscramble it without knowing the secret key. Before you get started on the activity, you know, the most naive way to actually try to break such an encryption scheme is by trying exhaustive key search. So here's the very basic strategy an attacker can always try, is try all possible keys. Okay, so the strategy is pick, make a guess for the secret key. Under that guess for the secret key, decrypt the message. If your guess was wrong, you're probably at garbled data, and you reject that key. Try another one. If your guess was correct, then you will get sensible data. Okay, that's the process of trying each key one at a time. So let's try that. So here's the same uh, challenge uh, message. Here's the first guess I make for the key. So I'm just guessing that maybe A is paired with N, B with the M, C with the L, and so on. And using this guess for the key, I'll decrypt the data. So I'll decrypt the M to B. I'll decrypt the I to F, and so on. Okay, when I do that, this is what I get. And so I conclude that, what's my conclusion? My guess was wrong, right? So the guess for the key was wrong. So I'll try another key and continue. Okay, eventually I will find the right key. The question is how long will it take me to find the right key? So let's count the number of keys there are. So the total number of keys is roughly seven, uh, nine trillion. And the reason is when Alice picks a secret key, she first has to pair the letter A with another letter. And she has 25 choices to pair A with, any one of the other 25 letters. But once she's paired A with a letter, let's say with N, she has to pair the letter B. How many letters can she now pair B with? How many choices are there? She's used up A and N already, because they've been paired, and she's trying to pair B with something. So this has 23 remaining letters to pair B with. So the 23 choices to pair B with, which is my next number, and so on. Have, having paired B with a, with a letter, there's 19 choices to pair the next letter with. So the total number of secret keys is 25 times 23, times 21 times 19, all the way up to 5 times 3 times 1, which is about 7.9 trillion, or 8 trillion. That's a lot of keys. Right? So what I mean by a lot of keys, let's be a bit more precise here. Suppose there's about 300 folks in this room. Suppose we decide to, to, to together try to find the secret key by each trying a few of the keys at a time. So we don't try the same key. I split up the keys into 200 sets, and we each tr try our set of keys. Suppose we can try the keys at a rate of one per minute. So you pick a key, test it in one minute, and discard it until you find the right key. Okay, there's 200 people in the room working on finding the key at the same time. There's 7 trillion keys to find. There's 200 people in the room, which works out to about 40 th million minutes to find the secret key, which is about 79 years. And this is without bathroom breaks. Okay, so it would take us 79 years working together to find the secret key using exhaustive key search. So that's clearly a useless strategy. It will not work in practice. Does that mean the encryption scheme is secure? I've shown you a strategy which is guaranteed to fail. It takes us too long to find the keys uh, by hand using the exhaustive key search method. Is the encryption scheme considered secure? How much money would you pay for it, in other words? Anyone? Have I convinced you this is a good encryption scheme because finding the key takes too long? No, oh, she already broke it, right? So I guess you use a different strategy, of course, right? Yeah? Sure. So you, so, so you use a much cleverer strategy than I outlined, which is trying each key one at a time. She found a shortcut. And that's what makes encryption schemes hard to design because you design a secure way you think to encrypt messages. You studied for several months, several years even, and you exhaust all possible strategies and you conclude this must be secure. 
So you, you, you deploy the scheme in your product, some encrypt uh, email messages, for instance, and three months later, someone very clever has a nice idea, finds a really clever shortcut, and can totally break your encryption scheme. Okay, this is what makes encryption very interesting because you can design schemes you really believe are very secure, spend three years studying it, and conclude that it really is secure. Deploy it in a product, and three weeks later, someone's totally broken it because they had a really nice idea, which you missed when you were studying the scheme yourself. Okay, so, so maybe you can try, uh, in fact, breaking, oh, we need a better strategy, so find one, and your challenge in the next five to 10 minutes is to decipher this scrambled text and find the English message. There's a little hint on your sheet, namely, this was a message that was exchanged between Yvette and her granddaughter. All right, and I have my helpers here who can help you if you get stuck. All right, so maybe I can get started. So I assume most people have been able to uh, break this cipher and recover the unscrambled message from the scrambled message. And, and the main point here was, you know, the first strategy I tried was trying each key one at a time. And that would take us all together 79 years, which is ridiculous. While a slightly more clever strategy, which is understanding it from the context of the message, the first word was probably dear, and the last word was probably love, and so on. And very quickly then you recover the entire secret key and descramble the message. So it might take at most 10 minutes. So I've changed strategies from one that took 79 years to one that took 10 minutes per person. Okay, and that's the, you know, the main point of this presentation here is that when you design an encryption scheme, you might think your scheme is unbreakable because you've spent several years studying it and can't attack it. But the next day, someone clever might have a little spark of an idea and find a really clever shortcut which totally breaks your scheme.